Welcome to Making the Cut Podcast with Chris Hill and Sean Winner, where we help you succeed in life and business by sharing principles and strategies that guide some of the most successful people in the world. Welcome to episode 28 of the Making the Cut Podcast. I'm Chris Hill with my co-host, Sean Winner. Today on the show, we have Mark Schaefer, a globally recognized educator, speaker, business consultant, and author. Before jumping into the show, how about a quick word from our sponsor? That's right, Chris. Le Cordon Bleu is considered to be synonymous with outstanding quality, setting standards in both the culinary arts and the hospitality industry for over 120 years. If you want to set yourself apart from the competition, prepare for a career of exciting opportunities, learn the very best of new world innovation and cuisine with the principles, techniques, and artistry of French traditions. Apply at cordonbleu.edu. With that, Chris, I'm very excited to connect with Mark. He actually wrote a book called The Content Code, and I think you and I have talked about this in the past, but when I was trying to formulate on how to get traction with a platform, how to start a platform, how to get in to content marketing, if you will, read his book. And there was another book called Content Inc. And it fundamentally shifted the way that I thought about content marketing, the way that I thought about trying to build a platform. So it was super, super helpful. So I'm extremely excited to connect with him. Yeah, Sean, I'm excited to connect with him. You know, one thing in doing research, you know, I saw that he's connected with some of our other past guests, uh, Jay Bear and, and Scott Stratton. But before jumping in, Let's learn a little bit about Mark. Uh, he has a really well-known blog, businessgrow.com, which is one of the most acclaimed marketing blogs in the world. He's worked in global sales, PR, and marketing positions for over 30 years. He has advanced degrees in marketing and organizational development and holds seven patents, which is pretty cool. He enjoys teaching social media marketing courses and is a faculty member of, at Rutgers University and has lectured at many other universities, including Oxford and Princeton. He's a popular public speaker and has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Wired, Forbes, Fortune, CBS News, and many other global outlets. Sean, that was a mouthful. Let's jump in. What do you say? <laughs> Absolutely. Let's do a head first. Hey there, Mark. How's it going today? I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It's a pleasure. Uh, we, we're both huge fans of, of your work. Maybe before we dive into that, you could give us a brief background of yourself and how you've gotten to this uh, point in your career. Well, sure. Um, I spent uh, about 27 years working in the corporate world for uh, big global companies and marketing positions. And then uh, almost 10 years ago now, I went out on my own and started to consult and teach. And that's what I still do today. Uh, I am a marketing consultant. I teach in the graduate program at Rutgers University. I teach digital marketing there. I'm also a speaker. I like going around the world talking to people. And I've written six books, um, which seem to be very popular and are very helpful to people. And all of them are generally centered around best practices and new ideas around social media, content marketing, digital marketing in this new age. So that's a, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> and Mark, I came across your book, The Content Code, and it was at a time when I was wanting to build a platform and I wanted to help people in a certain way, a very specific way. So I had this idea of, of, a, of a platform for food entrepreneurs, just didn't really know how to get it launched, how to get it started. But because I came across your book months before and really understand some things, it fundamentally changed my thinking on content marketing and helped me understand it. Um, So number one, thank you. But number two, can you talk just a little bit about content marketing for the people that might not understand it on a a, uh, deep level? Sure. Well, first of all, Sean, thank you so much for your very kind words. I'm I'm very very proud of that book. It's it's helped so many people. And uh, last time I looked, uh, I, I it's, it's got over a hundred reviews on Amazon now. I think, and I think all all of them but one are a five star review. And the four star review said, "This is a five star review in disguise." I just don't give five star reviews. <laughs> 
So I'm very, very proud of the book. So to describe why content marketing is such an important idea today, let me first talk about my personal advertising consumption. I think you'll be able to relate to this. So I watch more TV than I've ever watched in my life, but I never see commercials unless it's a, maybe a sports program or a news event because I watch on Netflix or Amazon Prime. No TV commercials. I listen to my radio when I'm in the car constantly. I never hear one commercial because I subscribe to SiriusXM or I'm streaming from my iPod or my, from my mobile device. I subscribe to four online newspapers and several uh, online magazines. I start my day reading the local newspaper, the New York Times. I don't see ads. One third of, a, of Americans, and it's even higher in Europe, have ad blockers on their smartphones. They don't see ads. So my personal advertising consumption is down 95% in the last five years. Now, if you're a business that depends on connecting with new people and finding new customers through advertising, you've got a problem. And one of the answers to that problem is content marketing because people don't like ads. They block ads. They avoid ads at all costs. They'll pay subscriptions just so they don't have ads. But they will run to stories and information that will help them, help them make money, save money, learn something new, have a happier life, have a healthier life, maybe be entertained today. And so that's the core idea behind content marketing is people may not want our ads, they may not see our ads, but if we populate the web with really helpful, useful, quality content, and we do it in a clever way or in a, in a smart way as outlined in my content code book, then over time, we'll get the Google juice coming to us. The search results will be coming to us and we'll have you know, very high potential people that are interested in us, that want to interact with us, visiting us on our site because of our content. That's sort of content marketing in a nutshell. Now, Mark, how would you, maybe to clarify, relate permission marketing with content marketing itself? Is it a subset? No, I, I would say permission marketing. I believe that was um, coined by Seth Godin, if I'm not correct. If I'm, is that right? Was that Seth? I believe that was Seth yeah. Godin coined that yep. term. Yeah. So what he meant by that was that when people love your content, they're going to subscribe to it. They'll follow you on Facebook, for example. They're so, they'll subscribe to your blog or your podcast or your video series. And in essence, when, when they do that, they're saying, hey, it's okay for you to send me your stuff. You're special to me. They're, they're kind of raising their hands in a virtual way saying, it's okay to market to me. I'm giving you my permission. Now, <clears throat> The key idea and the permission marketing concept that might be a little misleading because you don't really want to overwhelm them with marketing or ads or they're going to drop you like a brick. You have to continue to create you know, helpful content that's not real spammy and salesy. For example, I've been blogging and creating – I've been blogging for 10 years – almost 10 years, I've been creating a podcast for five. And I, this is going to sound weird to a lot of your listeners, but I never sell anything. <laughs> I, you know, I'll mention maybe a book that I wrote or something like that just to be helpful, but I give them good ideas. And what happens is people start seeing my content and they'll say, they'll think to themselves, who is this guy? He has so many good ideas and he just gives them away for free. Click. Look at my website. Look at what I do. Subscribe to my blog. Subscribe to my podcast. And over time, I'm building an emotional connection to them. They think that they know me. Now, isn't that amazing? I mean, I've had people come up to me, just strangers, come up to me at, at conferences and, and meetings all the time. And they'll embrace me like a long lost brother. 
Now, how many cold calls would you have to make to get a response like that? We're using content to really pre-populate the business relationships. People think they know us, even if we don't know them. And that results in business benefits over the long term. Now, how does one stand out from the noise, essentially, that's out there? Because there's a lot of content being produced right now. What, what's some of your advice in terms of standing out? Well, I would say that's probably preoccupied me to the point of an obsession, <laughs> 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 to be honest, <laughs> and not even in a healthy way. Um over the last couple of years, because I mean, I'm a marketing strategist and I just don't want to go to my customers and say, oh, well, it's getting harder and harder to, to cut through the noise. It's getting more and more crowded out there, you know, too bad. I want to know what to do. So that's really been the concept behind my last two books. The content code is more oriented toward a company known my new book is called uh, Known, Building and Unleashing Your Personal Brand in the Digital Age. Kind of puts those practices into use for us as individuals. And let me tell you why I think that's important. It's more than important. It's vital. It's essential for your listeners to, to, to know about and to understand I started off our discussion talking about how we don't see ads anymore. Well, you know, uh, when I was a little boy, the only soap my mother ever bought was ivory soap. Why? Because that's what she saw on TV. So she trusted that brand. I was at over, over at a young woman's house a few weeks ago, and she had this soap there from the Knoxville Soap Company, where I live. And it was cucumber and grit soap. I said, why did you buy this soap? Why not ivory or dial? What makes you love this brand? She thought for a moment and she said, you know, I don't know if I love the brand, but I love the hands that made it. The people who make this soap are awesome. I've met them. They're, they give back to the community. They're active in the community. They're creating their products in a sustainable way. So she is dedicated and loyal to this quirky little soap company because of the emotional attachment to the people, not the product, not an ad, not a jingle, not a press release, not a sign, but the people. And I think there's, there's a lot of lessons there for chefs as well, for, for restaurant owners or for people who are you know, maybe private chefs or caterers or something like that, that – Sure, you know, we, we want great food at a reasonable price and we want great service. We want it to be delicious. We want everything to work out. But you know what? There's a lot of people that can do that. But what really stands out is if we build that emotional connection, build our personal brand to be known on the web today, that's the thing that's going to ultimately make a difference. Either you're known or you're not. And if you're known, you have a permanent and sustainable competitive advantage over your competitors. So why wouldn't you be intentional about that? Why wouldn't you try to nurture your personal brand in a, in a proactive way? And I, I, I just think it's, it's, it's essential today. I definitely want to come back to that. I do have a bit of a selfish question here, Mark. So <laughs> As a content creator myself, you know, I, I've i had certain articles that have, that have gone viral and I know what kind of will will work with the audience in terms of um, an emotional connection and everything. At the same time, you know, a lot of what we see out there is listicles and things of that nature that are kind of the low hanging fruit, lowest mm -hmm. common denominator kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I get stuck sometimes with, do I do I want to go after the low hanging fruit at times that might be a little bit easier that I know will be shared or do I create something that is really meaningful that maybe won't connect with people on as, uh, as on a wide level, but on a deeper level. Does that make sense? 
It does, and it's an excellent question, Chris. So one of the very profound things I learned when I was writing this new book is the importance of consistency. Consistency is more important than genius. It's more important than being an expert or having that big idea. So the people who are doing these you know, listicles and infographics, they might be getting a quick hit. And believe me, going viral, it doesn't mean that much. You get a sur- su- sudden burst of traffic to your website and then it goes away the next day or within two days. There's no shortcut. It's slow and steady. You build your audience by adding your voice, your personality to what you love. So I'll give you an example, a food-related example. I was down in uh, Brazil, and a friend of mine said, oh, you've got to meet Isadora. She's a food blogger. And I thought, oh, boy, another you know food blogger. How, there's, a, there's a billion of them, right? Well, what Isadora has done is she's combined her absolute passion for food and cooking with her other passion, which is uh, television and, and movies. So what she does is she creates on video famous recipes from the movies, like a famous dinner scene or, or, or something. And she dresses up like the characters as she makes her recipe. So, for example, on one video, she painted herself yellow and dressed up as Marge Simpson and taught the audience how to make Homer's donuts. Now, it took her three years before she could say, this is my career now. This is, this is what she does full time. She has sponsors. She's written a cookbook now. She's being invited to national television shows. So she's well known. But it, it wasn't low-hanging fruit at all. It was consistent, hard work over a period of years. And that's what really makes the difference. You, there's, there is no shortcut. Look, I would have loved to have written a book, How to Build a, per, a, you know, a Powerful Personal Brand in 30 Days or Less. Can't do it. It's not honest. People, you, you, nobody can promise you that. It, but you've got to start. You've got to start. You've got to keep at it. And and there's lots of exercises in the book. There's lots of encouragement in the book. There's inspiring stories from all sorts of different entrepreneurs around the world. Some of them were homeless. <laughs> Some of them were destitute. Some of them were plastering posters on 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 telephone poles to try to get people to come to their business until they discovered this formula on how to be known that I talk about in the book. Mark, I, I read a, a couple of statistics and I'll read it really quick because it'll kind of give context to this direction because I really want to dive into the to the known aspect and building a personal brand. But I read that uh, 70% of millennial consumers are influenced by recommendations of their peers in terms of buying decisions. And then also that same survey said that 30% are more likely to buy a product recommended by a non-celebrity blogger. I think it, it speaks volumes to the direction that you're taking individuals to to understand that there's a massive opportunity in building a personal brand. You don't have to be this mega celebrity to be able to do it full time or have a career with it. Um, do, do you have insight as it relates to those statistics or kind of, you know, a thought process as it relates to that? Well, I, th- I think a lot of it simply gets down to human nature. You know, if you think about how we form business relationships for centuries, it had nothing to do with advertising. It was people that we knew. I mean, I, in some of my classes, I use my grandfather as an example. My grandfather was a plumber for 50 years. He didn't have social media. He didn't have a newsletter. He didn't have branded content, never took out an ad in his life. But if you think about how he connected to his customers – That's what we need to keep in mind today because people are people. They're still the same. My grandfather knew that 
his reputation was his brand. So he took good care of customers. He responded to customers. If something went wrong, he took care of it right away because he knew uh, he couldn't do anything to jeopardize his, his uh, reputation. He, he knew there, that social was a, a part of it. He would hang around with his customers and maybe have a beer after we he was done with his job. He knew people from his community, from his neighborhood, from his city. Um, so this is what people still want today. And we get blinded sometimes. One of the things that is so disheartening to me is that marketing today is, is run by IT people and SEO experts and statisticians that are doing A-B testing and trying to create backlinks and pop-up ads and all this stuff that people hate. And that's not what we want. Just as you said, what's moving marketing today? It's listening to people we know. It's even, we'll, we will believe a review from a stranger before we'll believe an ad from a company. So that, this, this humanistic approach to marketing is where we need to go. We're lost. Marketing is broken and lost uh, today. Uh, the reputation of marketing just keeps going down and down and down and down and down because, you know, we're associated with, you know, you know, SEO tricks and pop-up ads and, you know, all these things that people detest. You know, my rule as a business person is find out what your customers love. Now do that. (laughs) And somehow we've, we've forgotten about that. And what people love is, is interacting with people and, and the research that you mentioned and all the research I'm seeing these days reinforces that idea. People want to connect with people. Now, maybe as it relates to you know, Isadora, as you mentioned, I know she's in the book. You, you talk about in the book how building a personal brand or it could also just be for a brand in general. We need to kind of first start with what we want to represent. Could you touch on that for a bit? Yeah, that's a very important first step. So just to kind of take it up a, a, a level, there was, there's a tremendous amount of research that went into the book. I uh, worked on it for about a year and a half. And uh, in addition to standard you know, research and academic research, I also did my own research by interviewing nearly 100 people in many different fields, including food-related fields, from all around the world. And what I found is that every person in every occupation, in every place in the world, did the same four things. And the first thing is you have to have a clear idea of what you want to be known for. Now, that may or may not be the same thing as your passion. A lot of people get that confused. And I think we all know a lot of people who say, oh, you know, I love baking. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, I'm passionate about baking. I'm going to open up a bakery and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're closed in six months because they didn't plan it out. They didn't think it through. Uh, And so what my book, why it's important, I think, is that passion without a plan is just a hobby it's fine to have a hobby. Everybody should have a hobby, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's a business. So you need to think through what you want to be known for. Is it meaningful to an audience that's big enough to matter? So there's lots of exercises. I think there's eight exercises just in that one chapter to help people think through, how am I going to stand out? What's my story? What's different about me? You know, for Isadora, it was, I love movies. You know, I just, I can't get enough of movies and television. How do I merge that with my love for food? And she's doing it in a unique way. And it just shows even in a very crowded market like food, certainly there are still ways that people can stand out. But it does take some thought beyond just following your passion. 
And so now what would you say for the individuals that they they come up with this clear vision, they know what they want to be known for, whether it's a granular level, tactical level, strategic level, how do they really kind of start getting um, traction with, with getting themselves out there? Well, that's, that's pretty easy. You need to, you need to just start. That's the hardest part for a lot of people because they either get distracted or they don't have the confidence. Maybe it's not the right time in their life. They don't have the time that they can devote to it. But I think the key thing is don't worry about getting it right. You probably didn't, <laughs> As a, to be quite honest. But here's the image I want you to have in your mind. So there's a famous quote from uh, the great sculptor and painter Michelangelo. And they asked him, how do you create these amazing statues, these figures? And he said, the, the figure is, is in the stone. I just get it out. And that's what happens once you start creating content and building your brand. You will get feedback from the world. You'll get feedback from your audience. Suddenly they'll say, you know, I loved it when you said this on that video or you taught us how to do this. And you'll think, really? Hmm, maybe I'll do a little bit more of that. So your audience, it's like a sculpture, a sculptor, chip, chip, chipping, 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 getting that personal brand, forming it. I mean, my personal brand, it gets tweaked, you know, every six months. I'm still evolving and I've been creating content for almost 10 years. I'll get feedback from my audience and I, you know, I'll take a little shift here or there. I'm getting better all the time and you'll be better six months after you start. It'll be easier. You'll be more confident. It'll be more fun, but you'll never experience that unless you start. So starting is, is really the biggest step uh, toward progress you can take. Yeah, you know, I just look at, at my kind of journey over the last you know, seven or eight years. I started you know, just doing recipes, and then I wrote an article that, that got a lot of traction that really connected with a lot of people. And kind of like with you, I definitely shifted and tweaked you know, my message and where I was going with it. I think – it sounds like what you're saying is instead of having a very broad understanding of, Oh, I like to cook or I like to bake, but I like to cook this type of food for these types of people, this type of environment. And then as a result, people can really connect with it on a deeper level. Right? Yeah. I, that's part of it. And also I want to emphasize the importance of, of adding your personality, adding your story, you know, Anybody can, can create a recipe and say, you know, here's my favorite recipe for meatloaf. But there's only one person that could create content that says, here's the meatloaf that saved my life. Or here's the meatloaf that saved my business or saved my marriage. Or, you know, here's a recipe that makes me cry when I make it. Here's a recipe that brings me joy. Here's a recipe that changed the way I look at, at, at cooking. You know what? That's content that's irresistible. And it's irresistible because you're adding your own personality. By definition, to stand out today, you have to be original. And to be original, you have no choice. You have to add your personality, your story. You can't just create the same content that everybody else is creating. But that's easy because you have no competition. There's only one you. And if you have that courage to add your personality, to add your story, uh, to, to bring your fun and your joy and your insight to the world, you'll, you'll be okay. Yeah, I love that. Now, Mark, I can tell you with me, one thing that I've struggled with was getting too emotionally involved with the feedback that came uh, to the platform that I'm building or even myself. I, I would get people that maybe would say, 
it's not resonating with them, even down to some people that emphatically said they don't like it, uh, or even people that just like unsubscribe essentially after I send something out. And, it, and I started taking it a little personally. It was a little hard to get that feedback. I classified that as a mistake. I course corrected and said, you know what? This is just feedback. Take it logically, learn from it. Now, what, what would you say for people that are trying to become known, building a personal brand, they are getting some of that feedback. Maybe it's feedback, maybe it's not, but what would you say are some of the mistakes that they make along the way in relation to putting themselves out there? Well, a couple of things. And first of all, I want to acknowledge that getting negative feedback is, is really hard. And there's, we mentioned um, Seth Godin earlier in our discussion and Seth Godin wrote one time the, the reason he doesn't ha- allow comments on his blogs is he can't stand it. He cannot stand negative feedback. It just, he gets obsessed with it. He just can't get it out of his mind. So even someone who's revered in the marketing space, who's written many, many books like Seth Godin still can get thrown off center by negative feedback. So you're saying it was okay that I cried? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely okay. Well, but I think but I think you took a very healthy perspective. Number one, you didn't ignore it. And you didn't get obsessed by it. You looked at it as a data point. You weighed the benefits of it and you adjusted. I think that's healthy. Negative feedback in the right context is a gift. It's helping us. I mean, we wouldn't grow as as entrepreneurs or as individuals if, if everybody just told us everything was great, even when it wasn't. So, uh, you know, one thing that, that drives me nuts is this mantra on the social web is about, you know, well, haters going to hate. You know, the the implication of that is that when people say something, even if it's constructive, you're a hater, uh, and that you should just ignore it and move on. And I think that is very bad advice. I think you do need to consider negative feedback, but in in context, consider it as one data point. Make a decision. Is this valid? Am I going to make an adjustment and grow? Or, you know, this person is just coming from a place of jealousy or there's something else going on in their lives and I'm going to, I'm going to block it out, which is also a perfectly fine decision, but make it a decision. Don't, you know, put the emotion aside and say, okay, how do I use this to be, become better? You know, do I, do I use it or not use it and don't internalize it. It doesn't have to become, you know, part of, your personality or what you think of yourself, but just look at it dispassionately as critical feedback. You know, it, basically people are helping, you know, chip away that, that's, that sculpture. <laughs> yeah. So let them chip, let them chip and, and look at it as a gift. Yeah. And I think Sean too, at least the way I try and look at it sometimes, you know, objectively you know, is what I'm making for this person in the first place. I think that's a that's a very key point. I love that point that you're not going to appeal to everybody. I recently had an, an, an experience where I had a, a post go viral on LinkedIn of all places. It was kind of un, unexpected, but this thing got almost like 700,000 views. Wow. Thousands and thousands of comments. And I just made an innocent little observation about how I was tired of being spammed on LinkedIn. And it ignited this firestorm because, you know, all the people doing the spamming, you know, got really defensive. <laughs> and uh, they, they really, they, they, you know, they, they, one guy called me a pathetic douchebag. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and one of my good friends wrote me, he said, that's not fair. You're not pathetic, dot, 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 which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> Unfinished thought. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but you, you have to again. You have to just put it in in uh, context, and you realize that the people who know you, the people who are building that emotional connection to you, they're never going to treat you that way because they know what you're about and they're sticking with you. 
And by the way, you know, for uh, there's probably lots of people listening who are just starting out and are thinking, oh, you know, I'm not an expert. What can I bring to the world? Nobody starts as an expert. The whole idea here is bring people along with you on your journey. Bring people along on the journey. When I started blogging, I was terrible, terrible. Nobody was reading it. Nobody was commenting. Nobody was sharing it. But five years later, I wrote the best-selling book on blogging, a book called Born to Blog. I couldn't have written that when I started. But after five years of hammering through it, I learned a lot of great stuff. I became really good at it because I didn't give up. I was consistent. I've blogged twice a week, every week, without missing for almost 10 years now. Wow. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's what wins the race. It's, it's, it's that consistency. But, you know, you, you, have to, you have to start. Don't worry about being an expert. Just take people along on your journey, your ups and your downs. And that's what builds that friendship, that support, the emotional connection. Well, and I know in the book, too, you, you talk about one of the things, common themes you saw in all of the you know, 100 or so interviews that you conducted was that it didn't happen overnight, that they had this sense of resiliency. Absolutely. And the other kind of magical thing about the people who, who really break through, this is another thing that I learned through the book. When I was interviewing these people, I kept hearing this theme, they kept saying, well, what really keeps me going is I know I'm helping people. And I thought, you know, that just can't be a coincidence. There, there's something deeper there. And I came across this piece of research, a book written by Angela Duckworth called Grit. She did uh, uh, research kind of on the psychological principles of why some people can persist and others don't. And one of the foundations of grit is purpose, having some sense that what you're doing is beyond money. It's beyond you. It's, it's serving the world in some way. And sometimes you know that at the beginning. Sometimes you don't know it until you're into it. And that's what happened to me. When I started creating content, I was trying to build a business, but what really fuels me today is I guarantee you every week, usually several times a week, I get a note or a message or an email from someone saying, you've changed my life. You've changed my business. I can't believe the impact you've had. I was at a, uh, I gave a speech in Louisville. Kentucky two weeks ago, and a lady ran up to me after the speech. She said, I just couldn't wait to meet you. She said, I, f I followed your, your, the, the advice that you gave me in my book, Known. It gave me this clarity and this path that I'd been looking for. She said, I've, I've only been into it three or four months. I've already won an award for my content. I'm already becoming known in my industry. And she had tears in her eyes. That's my fuel. That's my fuel. To me, you know, at this point in my career, I mean, that's better than money. I know there's people out there that I'm helping. And uh, sometimes you know your purpose. Sometimes it becomes apparent only after you've been in it for a few years. Now, one of the things that I'm curious about for the audience is that when, when people are trying to grow their personal brands or they're, they're putting themselves out there is... Sometimes it can be lonely. Sometimes it can be tough by not getting some of those results right away that they have their eye on that that you know, I know that might come three, four, five years later, but they believe that it should happen in a week or two. You know, is there a way for people to think about that that process as they're going through number one and number two, is there a way for them to measure some of those early results or have certain KPIs that they're looking at so that they can stay motivated throughout? I spent a lot of time thinking about that and researching that question for my book, because I think that is a very essential question. When do I know it's time to quit? When do I know I need to pivot or adjust in some way? 
And you have to look at the other piece of feedback here is the biggest problem is that people quit too soon. For the people I interviewed in my book, it took about two years for the big things to really happen. So what I outline in my book is, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, you're not going to be an overnight success. I mean, that's a one in a million kind of thing. It's the slow and steady progress of building this actionable audience that's going to help you help make your dreams come true over time. And so I articulate this system in the book. And actually, there's also a workbook that goes with the book. And in the workbook, there's actually a spreadsheet you can download to help you keep track of these measurables. And what I encourage people to do is look at qualitative measures as well as quantitative measures. So a quantitative measure is something you can quantify or count, like money, like a sales lead. But there are also qualitative measures like what if people found you through your content and asked you a question or invited you to be on a podcast or invited you to contribute a recipe or a, or a video for their show? Those are all signals that it's working. As long as those signals are coming at you, you can't stop. It's working. It's building. The momentum is there. You've got to keep going. And look, this really works. I mean, I, I helped coach uh, a, a wonderful uh, guy in uh, England. You know, his business was struggling. He was having a hard time paying his bills. He was about to give up on his on his entrepreneurial effort. And I got him focused. We kind of, you know, came up with what he wanted to be known for that was really aligned with his values and where he wanted to go in his life. He started creating content and he started keeping track. He was, you know, he was invited to speak at a conference. Uh, his email uh, subscriptions were, were they quadrupled in just a few months. That's an important sign. All those little things are important signs that the momentum is going, is growing. And then, you know, sure enough, six to nine months down the road, the money started coming into the money started flowing into, it doesn't happen all at once may not happen for a year or a couple of years. But you just have to watch for those little signs that the momentum is building, you're becoming known, and keep at it. And those might not even be exactly measurable is what you're saying, right? Well, it's, it's well, how do you measure, like, okay, so this is a wonderful opportunity for me. I'm being interviewed on your podcast today. Maybe what I say will touch people in new parts of the world that have never heard me before. Maybe there are people out there that will say, well, who is this Mark Schaefer guy? Uh, I'm going to read his blog. I'm going to follow his podcast or I'm going to buy his book. You, you just don't know. I don't know how to measure the ROI of this conversation. Can't measure it. I can't quantify it. But it is a, a, a qualitative sign of success because I wouldn't be here if you didn't know me, if you hadn't heard of me, if you didn't have some emotional uh, connection. I mean, Sean started the show in a very kind way talking about how my book had had such an amazing impact on him. And that's why I'm here. This is a business opportunity that's opened up to me because you guys, I mean something to you guys. And that's you, you forget about the ROI. I have no idea what the ROI of this podcast is going to be, but it is a sign that I'm becoming known and that's important and it's tangible. And we need to, we need to acknowledge the value of that just as we would acknowledge, uh, a, a, you know, an order of someone giving us money. Yeah. I love it. Well, before wrapping up, Mark, could you talk a bit about maybe some of the mistakes folks make? You know, aside from maybe quitting early, that uh, when they're trying to become known, they, they make the UC happening? 
Well, you know, I think, you know, patience, patience is um, a, a big one, is that people give up uh, too early. I think another problem is maybe their expectations are too high. Um, they think that this is going to be a magic bullet that's going to save their business in, in 30 days. And, and that's just not the way it works. But, you know, you will be you you are building something that's lasting. Emotional connections are lasting. And uh, that's important. And finally, I think I would say that um, some people try to sell too hard. Um, they look at, you know, my new audience as something that I can sell to or something that I'm going, that I can spam. And you can never, ever jeopardize that trust. The reason people will stick with you, the reason that you'll stand out from the crowd ultimately is because they trust you. You can't do anything ever that will breach that trust if you want to build a long-lasting, sustainable, and meaningful personal brand. So, Mark, uh, any final thoughts for the listeners, for the audience uh, that you might have before we, we part ways today? Well, I mean, I, I meant what I said, that you know, talking to you guys today, and first of all, I want to thank you. You've done a wonderful job preparing for the show. You've asked excellent questions, and I really appreciate your support and the fact that you actually have read my books. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never, ever take that for granted. It's such, um, it's such a gift. It's an irreplaceable gift when people spend time with me and my content, and I'll never take that for granted. So thank you and, and, and congratulations on the great show. And I think this is a great opportunity for maybe me to connect with new people. So I'd love to hear from people who listen to the show. Stop by my, my blog, say hello, follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and take a look at my books, my podcast, and my blog. I'd love to hear from you. You can find everything at uh, businessesgrow.com. I knew nobody could spell Schaefer. That I'd be totally lost if my website was Schaefer.com. I figured businesses grow is something people could probably spell and remember. So businesses grow, it is. Well, we'll definitely link to, to, uh, to the website and your uh, social media handles. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, fellas. So that was our conversation with Mark Schaefer. Sean, I feel like you were a kid in the candy store, man. <laughs> yeah, you nailed that one. Uh, you know, there, there's some people that we've talked to over the course of this past year that I have, that I hold in great admiration. And Mark is definitely one of those, especially with his book, The Content Code. I just, I can't stop raving about that because uh, how impactful it was. And, uh, and his new one even known. So I think... I think for me, there was a, quite a few things that stood out. Um, I think in relation to the audience, there are some things that should stand out for anybody that's wanting to build a platform. One for me is is definitely that negative feedback that he said negative feedback in the right context is a gift. And when you can have that 
frame of mind when you are receiving negative feedback. I think it's so empowering. And when you can turn it into a data point and you remove emotion from it, now it's easier said than done. Uh, Chris, you and I have talked a couple of times when I, I, I think I lost my, you know what, when uh, I was upset about certain things or feedback that I got. But yeah, I think, I think it's really a healthy thing to do when you can just remove emotion, dispassionately look at it as a data point and, uh, and use it. Um, and then the other thing I think is that uh, nobody is an expert when they're starting out. I know for me, I wanted to be an expert starting out and it's really hard to put something out there when you know it's not at the level that you want it to be. But his thought process in relation to that, that he said, just bring people along for the journey. And I thought that was really powerful to me and it's a good frame of reference to, to have as you're putting yourself out there. Just, you don't have to be the expert. No one's an expert when starting out. Just go along for the journey, your journey, and then bring people along with it. So I thought those were two really powerful things. What about you, Chris? For sure, for sure. It, it was a really engaging, fun conversation. You know, I think along the same lines as what you just said, you know, as you're bringing people along the journey, you know, one thing that he said is consistency is more important than genius. So, yeah, I think, you know, no one is where they're going to be 10 years from now starting out. So you kind of become that genius along the way. And really the only way to do that is to can you continuously be consistent uh, with how you show up and like, you know, for him, I think he said for 10 years straight, he's you know, had a blog, two blog posts, you know, every single week. So, you know, maybe for some of our listeners, that's, you know, new recipes or it's, 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 um, you know, posting new photos on other food on Instagram, you know, twice a day, you know, whatever that might be. And then the other thing that really, you know, touched me, I think on an emotional level is you said, you know, you're building something that lasts, you know, you referenced that kind of here towards the end of the conversation. And, you know, one of the things I have to remind myself, especially in the in the earlier days, is you know this is a marathon, you know, not a sprint. And everything that you're doing right now, you know, for me and building my personal brand, that's something that I'll be able to carry with me for the rest of my career slash life. So everything you're doing now is helping you out, you know, down the road. And I think being able to have that long term view is something that's really really helpful. And Chris, when you say that, it reminds me of something. I actually just read something last night. It said, decisions form actions, actions form habits, habits form character, and character forms destiny. I love that. I saw, I saw it last night, actually, and it speaks volumes to what you're saying. It's just those, those daily decisions that you're making, those actions are making. It's, it's who you will become in that future state. So I love that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's good stuff. So you can connect with Mark over at his website, businessesgrow.com. You can check out his blog there, learn more about him and his books that we both highly recommend. And to finish things up, here's a quote from Mark, actually from our conversation, where he said, if you're known, you have a permanent and sustainable advantage over your competitors. And with that, we're signing off. 